Ok, Carla, você pode começar. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Maybe good morning, I'm not sure. And welcome to our panel from Pain to Hope in the Arab-Israeli Conflict. And we have here today amazing speakers. We have here with us Shule Dishter. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the names right. Feel free to correct me. He is an Israeli educator Dichter. and so Dichter. Dichter. He's an Israeli educator and social entrepreneur, a pioneer in the fight for an equal and shared society for Jews and Arabs in Israel. He is the co-founder and co-director of Nissan Center for Shared Society Research at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, former CEO of the Hand in Hand Network of Bilingual Jewish Arab Jewish Schools, and former co-CEO of Sikui a leading equality advocacy group in Israel. Currently, together with his partner, Dr. Amir Fahuri, Dichter is in the final stages of editing the first edition of the Palestinian Jewish Share Society in Israel, Lexicon of Terms. He lives with his family on Kibbutz Ma'anit and is the author of Sharing the Promised Land. Desculpa, eu vou ter que te interromper, Carla, me perdoe. Perdão, mesmo, mas é, estamos com um problema na cabine. Não está funcionando a cabine. Eu vou pedir para a gente fazer um teste para depois você reiniciar. Me perdoe. Okay. So if someone didn't understand, it seems we're having some trouble with the translation, so it will be just a minute. Agora sim. Estava com algum problema. Deixa eu ver se você está mesmo no português ou se eu interrompo a cabine. Só um minuto, por favor. Sim. Agora sim, Carla, não sei o que tinha acontecido. Eu repito? Só mais um pouquinho, por favor, Carla. Should I repeat what I've said before? Ok. Desculpa, viu? A outra Carla, agora a gente pode reiniciar, por gentileza. Obrigada. So again, welcome everyone. I'm going to say everything again, because um, if someone needs the translation, they didn't get it. Um, so first of all, welcome to our panel from Bang to Hope in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And we have, again, I'm going to repeat it, amazing speakers at this meeting. I first presented, and I'm going to present again, uh, Shuli Dichter, an Israeli educator and social entrepreneur, a pioneer in the fight for an equal and shared society for Jews and Arabs in Israel, he is also the co-founder and co-director of Nissan Center for Shared Society Research at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, former CEO of the Hand in Hand Network of Bilingual Arab Jewish Schools and former co-CEO of Sikui, a leading equality advocacy group in Israel. Currently, together with his partner, Dr. Amir Fahuri, Dichter is in the final stages of editing the first edition of Palestinian Jewish Shared Society in Israel, Lexicon of Terms. He lives with his family on Kibbutz Ma'anit and is the author of Sharing the Promised Land. Also with us here today, we have Laila Mohammed Al-Sheikh. I hope this is correct. Uh, she is from the Parent Circle. Laila is Palestinian Muslim, mother of five children. She studied accounting and business administration. And very, very sadly, Lila lost her son in 2002 because Israeli soldiers prevented her um, to going to the hospital for more than four hours. Um, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, Lila lost her son. And in 2017, she joined the parent circle. We have also with us here today, Robbie Damelin, spokesperson and director of international relations, also for the parent circle and family forum. Um, she joined the organization after her son was also very sadly killed by Palestinian gunmen. The Parent Circle and Family Forum is made up of more than 600 Palestinian and Israeli be bevered families who believe in nonviolence and reconciliation as a means of ending the occupation and that there must be a framework for a reconciliation process as part of any future political peace agreement. All of its work in Palestinian and Israel and internationally is aimed at this school. She has been interviewed by the most prestigious media outlets, CNN, BBC, Forbes, CBS, France 24, Indian TV, and many more. She has appeared on stages such as Albert Hall and Lincoln Center. Robbie was named Woman of Impact in 2015 by Women in the World, 
and was also selected by John B. Kroc for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego as a woman peacemaker. She is the protagonist of the award-winning documentary One Day After Peace, and she regularly contributes to media outlets in Israel and abroad. Robbie was invited to join the United Nations Security Council in May 2002. We are also waiting for Mr. Ali Abu Awad. We hope he can join us briefly. Um, Mr. Awad is a Palestinian peace activist and an advocate of nonviolence. He is the founder of Tahir Change, a Palestinian national movement that promotes nonviolence in order to achieve and assure a nonviolent solution for the conflict. Awad's history and efforts have been presented in several documentaries, including awarded movies such as Encountering Point and Forbidden Childhood. Mr. Ali Abu Awad was just awarded by the World Peace Forum for his efforts and initiatives to build peace. At this moment, he's finishing his memory book called Painful Hope. Thank you all for being here. I am Carla Habib. Um, I will be moderating this conversation today. I am Brazilian. So if you don't understand something I say, or if I'm all talking too fast, you can just tell me. If I pronounce something wrong, I'm so sorry in advance. Uh, I am the daughter of Egyptian Jews. There goes my last name. I'm a historian and an educator, and I currently work in the humanitarian field with an international NGO. I am taking my PhD in international relations, and I'm studying the role of nonviolence um, in this context that um, very unfortunately we've been testifying an increase of violence during the past few years in Israel and Palestine. And I'm studying that because I strongly believe we need to give more attention, more focus and more stage to nonviolence. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we will give each speaker around 20 minutes. They're gonna talk briefly about their history, their work, their activism, and then we will open the floor for questions. Um, so first, I'm gonna call uh, Mr. Shuli Dichter. You Hi, are good evening. Yeah. Um, um, I will. Uh, I'm the first one to talk because. Uh, uh, because uh, Mr. Ali Awad still didn't come in, um, and I was uh, planning to relate to what he says, but <laughs> um, I will uh, begin with this, that I was born and raised on a kibbutz in Israel. Uh, I still live on the kibbutz, um, and the kibbutz... Uh, is surrounded by uh, uh, Palestinian villages, now towns, and grew to be towns. Um, and uh, the villages uh, are actually bordering the kibbutz, uh, literally. But the kibbutz, what we, what we uh, consider the kibbutz is not the homes of the residents of the kibbutz, but rather the fields of where we grow our orchards and, and, and cotton or, or, or whatever we grow, uh, the agriculture. When I was uh, young, very young, uh, I used to plow the fields uh, all the way uh, to the edges of the Arab village of Baka al Gharbiya. Uh, south of Manit. It's about six kilometers away from Manit, but it is there where the fields uh, reached all the way to the homes of the village. And I used to plow it in a way that the soil would be covering the, the side of the areas, not our side. Uh, only the 70 centimeters of, of the plow it was that important to, uh, to ask kibbutzniks to show who is the owner of the land here, who is in charge, who is the lord of the land. Um, over the years, 
I have developed a very uh, fond relations, fondly relations with the uh, Palestinians around us, uh, with the Arabs, as we used to say, and very friendly. Uh, we visited each other and we had uh, meetings and uh, we loved to to um, create good social relations with uh, one another. And for many years, I'm saying 20, 30 years, I believed uh, that creating good social relations with uh, the Arab citizens around us uh, will be good enough to create um, a good society in Israel. Over the years, uh, I have started to create partnership with the Palestinians. When it comes to partnership, it's a little different than social relations. When I started to create partnerships, I slowly um, neglected the nice, the niceties, as as they say in English, and the uh, fond relations, and we found that creating a partnership is not easy. It part of it uh, um, uh, demands also um, creating new um, power power relations between us. I grew up to believe that I'm the strong one here. I'm the one on top. And the, uh, my Arab uh, neighbors grew up to believe or to, to the situation that they are uh, sub under us. Um, they create these uh, relations entered into the room of partnership as well. It was this way until the early 90s when the Palest my Palestinian partners started to demand equality in our relations within the partnership. It was a education, uh, it was a social and educational program in, uh, in another organization called Givat Chaviva that I worked it was then only that I started to understand that relations with my neighbors are not only nice thing to do, but rather creating framework for life. Slowly and painfully, uh, I started to give up power in order to create equality between myself and my co-director of the uh, program. I'm saying painfully because to me personally, it caused back pains, literally, I mean, physically even. Uh, every meeting, every presentation, every writing a paper became a struggle of powers in which language the paper will be written and to which language it will be translated. In Israel, naturally, it's written in Hebrew and translated to Arabic. The working language is Hebrew. The one who picks up the phone say, Shalom, but my partner was strong enough to demand equality. So we had even to share our uh, air uh, uh, air time when we had presentations. Not only I'm talking and he's saying, yes, yes, what he said is fine, but we had to share it equally. One time he, he starts, one time I begin. When we had to meet, when we met with officials in the Ministry of Education or wherever, Always, they spoke to me, not to my partner. And we had this, this trick of me looking at him while the official is looking at me to 
uh, to um, uh, make him look at him too. All these little tricks, all this um, painful way of uh, sharing the power made me um, understand that it is not only the educational program that must be shared, but the entire society must be shared. The entire country, if you will, must be shared. And when we say must be shared, equally shared. This is so out of range of Jewish, white, Ashkenazi, kibbutznik male like myself. Um, but it did get into my life. And uh, later, um, my entire, uh, I would say, uh, career is dedicated, since then, is dedicated to creating partnerships. Creating partnership between Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel, and I'm now only methodically talking about the citizens of Israel, because Palestinians and Jews we have from the sea to the river, and all of them, all of them deserve equality between one another. But practically, the, the partnerships that I used to create is with neighbors. Therefore, it was uh, with neighbors uh, uh, of, of uh, towns, cities, and kibbutzim, and sometimes inside the cities in Israel. <clears throat> When I'm saying this, I'm not ignoring the Palestinians who are under harsh uh, uh, occupation uh, and military um, uh, dictatorship in the West Bank and Gaza. But I'm beginning with the practical uh, option of creating a partnership here. So creating partnership between Jews and Palestinians within the state of Israel is actually a disruption of the social order of the state of Israel, because the social order of Israel is separation between Jews and Palestinians. Inside Israel, not only in the West Bank and Gaza, is, com is almost complete separation. We born and uh, uh, raised and live apart 92% of the citizenry in Israel are living apart in separate, in separate towns, cities, or um, villages, or kibbutzim, or communities, wherever. Only very few, only 8% um, uh, of the Palestinians live in uh, what we call mixed cities. They are not really mixed yet because the majority, vast majority of the city, of those cities are Jews. And those who are on top are Jews. Those who are in the city hall are Jews. And it's mainly creating a, uh, a surrounding a life, uh, a Jewish life in Hebrew. So creating a bilingual school in Haifa is disrupting the social order of separation of Haifa or Jaffa or uh, in the in the in the uh, in in Jerusalem definitely in Jerusalem or in the Galilee we have uh, in, now in Israel there are about uh, twelve um, uh, bilingual schools um, all over the country. But this is not enough because, well, the first, the first, the first um, uh, definition that I want to challenge is partnership. Partnership, I suggest to um, to um, include only um, frameworks of partnership. For example, 
uh, if you if you cooperate in a lim on a limited time between Jews and Palestinians, this is a this is cooperation, but not partnership. Partnership is an organization like the bereaved families organization that is shared by both and uh, or bilingual school or a theater that is uh, shared the uh, formally and the ownership of the framework is shared between both like the board of directors the directorships the agenda the programming everything is serving both sides it's the framework that defines the partnership the definition is the framework not only the action okay this is one thing the other thing is the sustainability is that that it does not have an expiry date no expiration it's forever this is partnership there are many partnerships inside israel there is there are few partnerships cross border between jews and palestinians on both sides of the uh, uh, of the of the occupation um and uh, this is a challenge that i mentioned the the uh, hardship from the jewish side i believe that from the palestinian side there is also uh, different um uh, challenges um, I think that this is the main thing that I wanted to say today, <laughs> uh, Carla. Uh, I think um, I'm not sure if I uh, if the, if 20 minutes are challenged also here. Uh, I don't uh, I don't want to talk much more. Uh, just to mention that in the in the um, development of partnerships and of the notion of partnership between Jews and Palestinians, we have reached now a point that we are trying to, um, to create a, um, a, a theoretical and conceptual framework for partnership, uh, for shared society, what we call shared society. And uh, in this, this effort is intellectual, and uh, therefore I'm not carrying it uh, by myself, and uh, I need the, um, to lean on uh, uh, someone who is uh, much uh, better intellectual stamina. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Amir Fakhouri. Uh, we, are, we are writing together the lexicon for um, shared society. We have now uh, 30 terms already ready. And we hope that we will publish the first edition of the lexicon in uh, 2023 by the end of this year um, and this lexicon will grow every year with few terms there are many terms uh, in this uh, lexicon such as solidarity such as shared society shared life partnership all these uh, terms that are part of our the world of shared society uh, will be in this lexicon. Uh, and I hope that this will contribute to, to enhance the uh, attempts of the, of, the, of the braves, such as the bereaved families and, and, and other, I would say, 15 to 20 uh, organizations uh, between the sea and the river that are, who are now creating uh, partnerships. And more than that, it should help those who want to create partnership and still hesitating or held back by not knowing how to do it or what it includes. So uh, we're trying to, to contribute to this. Uh, let's stop now and uh, I will, uh, I, I trust that the questions later will help me say what I want to say further. You, you didn't use your 20 minutes, but it was, it was great, yeah. As I mentioned, I am studying the role of nonviolence, and I believe you explained it very well and very in a very clear way, 
one of the most important roles of nonviolence is, is people learning that it, it's not that simple because sometimes talking about a peaceful society sounds something really beautiful and utopic. And when you put it in practice, you realize you, you weren't educated to do that. Like as you said, you were educated to live uh, segregated, separated, and nonviolence and cooperation partnerships are a way to re-educate us again. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, I we have uh, either Lila or Robbie from the Parent Circle. I'm not sure if you have a preference on the order. I would call Lila here in the document I have, but however you prefer. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us. And we are so happy to share with you and to talk to you about our experience. My name is Leila Sheikh. I'm from Bethlehem. I was born raised in Jordan. I'm a mother for five children. I'm a Muslim, Palestinian. Uh, I was born in Jordan because my family went to Jordan because my father, he's a teacher and he went to Jordan. He wanted to teach the children in the camps. And after that, the war was started in 1967. During that time, the Israeli government take a decision to close the border. So my parents lost their citizenship as Palestinian and become Jordanian. Um, childhood was very normal, but maybe the unique thing, my father has thousands of stories about Palestine. So I love Palestine from what I heard from my father, and it's become like a dream for me to visit it. So after I finished uh, counting business, I met my husband. He's originally from Bethlehem too. He came to Jordan, we engaged, and I returned back to Bethlehem in 1999. And that was like a dream come true for me. I become so happy to return back to visit all the places, all the people that my father talked about. And uh, I was really so happy to be here. And after one year, my happiness become much more when we have our first daughter and we think that life start to be good and everything will be okay. But after two months, the second uprising started. And during that time, the Israeli government took a decision not to give people like me who came from Arab countries a Palestinian ID. So that meant I can go freely from place to place and even I can visit my family in Jordan. But I didn't care a lot because I have my husband and my daughter to take care of. And um, after a second year, we have our second son. He was a boy. Uh, we love both of them so much. And our be happiness become much more. He was a beautiful boy, intelligent boy. But that happiness was ended 11th of April 2002. No, At that time, he became six months old. During that day, um, the Israeli soldiers to our village and they had their gas, so he became sick. So when we tried to take him to a hospital in uh, Bethlehem, because we live in a village outside Bethlehem, they prevented us and. Um, so we tried to take him to uh, Hebrew in the city to, to Bethlehem and they said that the main road is closed. So the last chance was to take him to Hebron, but the road will be so rough and long because it will be between villages. But for the third time, the Israeli soldiers stopped us. They uh, searched the car, they searched the ID of my husband, my father-in-law. And my father-in-law, because he's the only one who speaks Hebrew, he went to them, spoke to them, but tried to convince them to leave us because our son is in very critical condition and he should be in a hospital as soon as possible. But they didn't listen. So I start to think to have a risk and that risk will be if they find that I didn't have a Palestinian ID, maybe they will take me to jail or send me back to Jordan and I will never see my children again. But the only thing that I care about and think about, how could I save my son? So I went to them, started to talk to them, started to convince them to leave us, but they didn't listen. 
and um, they stopped us more than four hours. So uh, when we reached the hospital, the doctor said it's too late to save his life. And if he will be um, like alive after 48 hours, he'll be like a handicap. So the two choices was really so hard even to think about or as a young mother to accept. So um, I, after like a few hours, the doctor came and they take him to the intensive unit because he become much more sick. And the doctor said we should leave the hospital because as he said that the Israeli soldiers will came and they search the hospital and they will ask everyone to leave if he's not sick because as they claim that the Palestinian fighters came and hide inside the hospital. We tried to convince the doctor, but he didn't listen. So finally, we left the hospital, and that was so hard for us. How could I left my son alone there without being beside him at that critical time? So immediately, when I reached the house of my parents, law, um, I take the phone, I call the doctor to check and ask about my son. So he started to talk, and, talk and I used to understand what you talk about. So my husband came and he said, what's going on? I said, I don't understand what he's talking about. Please talk to him, but let the speaker on. I want to hear him. So he did the same thing to my husband. Um, I start to shout at him and ask him what's going on. And he oh, said, um, I'm so sorry, your son died. Um, at that moment, I felt that um, his word was like a bullet comes to my heart, down, smash it down for many pieces. I start to cry. Um, didn't know what to do. So um, five minutes later, the house was full of people, relatives, neighbors, friends. But for me, I didn't care about any one of them. The only thing that I care about is my son. So I started to convince myself when we returned back home, I slipped in the car and this is just a dream. And uh, tomorrow morning I will bring him back and everything will be okay. But unfortunately that was the truth. And that night I have a dream. There is a white dove came and stand on my shoulder and say to me, mama, don't cry, I'm so happy. But I couldn't stop crying from that moment and speak about him or even wear him. That was the longest night I've ever had in my whole life. In the morning, I was waiting for them to bring him back home to say goodbye for him. But until the moment that they put him between my arms, I was still think he's alive, but they lie for some reason. So I take his blanket off because I missed him so much. And I was shocked when I saw him, he was very blue. So I tried to uh, to kiss him because I, but that kiss was so different. I felt that I kissing of frozen rock. Immediately I hugged him so tight because I believe in miracles and I thought maybe some kind of miracle will happen and he will go back to life. But the only happened that they take him away from me, and that was the last day I saw my son. From that day, I was filled with hatred, anger against everyone, but especially against the Israelis, because for me at that time, they all of them were responsible about his death. Um, but at the same time, I didn't think to take revenge, because revenge for me will never bring him back. But I take a decision that I didn't want to have any kind of relationship with any Israeli person. Um, the time passed and um, even during three, three years after that, my husband, my family started to convince me to have another child and I refused. And one day my doctor asked me why you didn't want to have children. And I said, why I will have them if finally I will lose them? Because somehow they will be part of the cycle of violence if I, if I really like or even if I'm not. Maybe they will go to jail for the rest of their life or maybe they've been killed. But after three years, we had our third son 
he was a boy and I give him the same name Kusai because I didn't want to forget what happened to my son every time I looked to his eyes every time I called his name so after 16 years I met one of my friends I didn't saw him for a long time. We started to talk about many things. And then he started to talk about the Burn Circle and how he joined one of their uh, um, projects. And uh, I refused to listen to him in the beginning. And I thought he's crazy because in my whole life, I was in terror about this kind of organization. And one day he invited me to a conference in Bethlehem. Um, in the beginning, I was really confused because I didn't, I wasn't even convinced about what he's talking about. But I, I said, but when we arrived in the beginning, there were Palestinian. I said with them, we start to talk. But then the Israelis start to came. When they start to enter that room, I start to feel there is something act me in my chest, I don't want to see them, I don't want to be with them. And I tried to leave, but he convinced me just to sit and listen. And during that, I, uh, I saw something amazed me. I saw the Palestinian, the Israelis laugh together, they shake their hands together, they hug each other like a family members, not just even as friends. And I was really shocked because that was the first time I saw something like that. And um, when I heard the Palestinian stories, it was a normal thing because I know most of these kind of stories or even I know some of those people. But when I listened to the Israelis and to their personal stories and how they lost their beloved ones, I was really shocked and uh, touched moved because that was the first time really I felt we share the same pain, we share the same tears because um, nothing worse than losing a child and no one could understand that pain unless someone be in the same situation. So from that day I decided to be a um, member on the forum and participate one of the projects called Baron Narrative Project and this project is one of the most important projects that we have, it gives chance for the Palestinian and even the Israel to sit, to listen to each other, to talk about everything. Because for us, we have, um, or we haven't a chance even to meet most of the time. Because as a Palestinian, I just saw settlers or soldiers. But to meet a normal people like me, I didn't have any chance. And it's like for most of the Palestinians, and even for the Israelis, they just saw workers and um, maybe they did, it didn't have a chance even to talk to them. So we met for eight times. We have two professors from both sides and um, they spoke about the, the history of the two nations. Uh, we uh, went to visit Yad Vashem Museum to learn much more about the Holocaust because some of Palestinians, they didn't believe about the Holocaust. They thought that the Israeli fake it because they want to justify what they are doing in Palestine. And we even visited a Palestinian village was existed before 1948. It's not kind of comparing the pain. It's not kind of um, like said who's wrong, who's uh, right, who's first or second, who have like the right to be in this country or not. It's kind of understanding each other way about our trauma, about our history, about culture, about everything. So during that project, um, one day we have like, um, um, they called it, okay. They asked us to spoke about uh, something happened during the um, the conflict affect our life. So that was the first time I spoke about what happened to my son. Even between me and my family, we didn't spoke about what happened to him. And that was so hard for me after 16 years. It's like to open the wound again, bring the memories back, the pain, the anger, everything. And I couldn't complete the story. 
Then an Israeli woman came and she started to apologize. And she said to me, I'm so sorry. Yes, I did hurt you. But the people who hurt you from my own people. And I'm a mother too. I could understand your pain. I could understand even the words that you couldn't say. And she came and hugged me. Both of us start to cry. She didn't know that day by her simple words that she returned me back to life. She changed my whole life again. From that day, I decided to be a member in the Forum Strategic of Life, Turnside, Israel, Palestine, all around the world to spread the message of peace and reconciliation. And uh, I learned a lot of things during that time. And one of the things like uh, to stop looking to myself as a victim, because this is so important. And uh, I thought that Everything become good and life become great again. And um, I just do whatever I like I could. And during that time, I remember that dream about the white dove. I know my son, he's happy with God because he's still like just six months old. But what I was as a white dove, but then I realized after I joined the parents circle, it's like kind of message from God that he want to show me like this is your new mission in life and he didn't want uh, the death of my son went without achieving something so give me hope to continue every time and um, six months ago life gave me a new test we've been a meeting me and Robbie in Jerusalem with other NGOs and um uh, after we spoke about the personal story, a man in stand-up called Khen Alon, he is from Combatant for Peace, and he started to talk about his personal story. I know this man from like three years ago, and we are friends, but I didn't listen to his story before. So when he started to talk about his story, he mentioned that he served in my area. He was a high officer. And he said he prevented a Palestinian coach have six children from going to a hospital. And then it's become really so hard for me. It's like someone slapped me in my face. I didn't know what to do. In the beginning, I couldn't even cry. I start to, um, I can't breathe even. So then Robbie to go outside the room to speak. And then he started to mention that, and he said, it was so hard for me to, to speak in front of you, but it, at the same time, it's so important for me to tell you that. And I wanna tell you that one day my son became very sick. And when I tried to take him to a hospital, the guard stopped me because he wanna know which like session I wanna take him. And he asked me a few questions, and, I was in a hurry because he was in a very critical condition. And then he said, in that moment, just I realized what I did to the Palestinian. He's quit from the army because of that. He jailed because of that. And he established this organization, which called Compatent for Peace with ex-Palestinian prisoners. And I looked to him and I said to him, look, um, this is so hard for me to listen to you. But at the same time, I want to thank you because if I know that part of your story was exact and you didn't tell me, I will never forgive you. But because you have that courage and that honesty to speak in front of, of me, I will forgive you. And then I realized this is reconciliation. It's so easy to to talk about peace, reconciliation, love, all these lovely words. But the most important thing to mean it, to work with it, not just to say this word. So uh, that if, even give me like a big push to continue because I, at that day I realized I, I meant every word I say, I meant everything I did. And that gave me even uh, like uh, a new vision to continue and to learn a new thing. And now I have many friends from the Israeli side. Some of them, they are so closer to me than my family members. Uh, I 
spend some time, most of the time with them, much more than my family. I travel a lot with Robbie Damlin, and we have together, and she's not a partner and a colleague. She's like a sister for me, and uh, I learned a lot from her. So much for inviting me. Thank you. I don't think we have enough words to thank you for telling us your story. So, yeah. Robbie, you have a follow So, um, yesterday was actually uh, International Peace Day of the United Nations. So, 40 kids, Palestinian and Israeli, from the parent circle who all come from bereaved families, signed a charter at the UN building in Jerusalem. And I think I will read you just quickly what they said, what they signed on. We, the Palestinian and Israeli children of bereaved families who are members of the Parents Circle Families Forum, are part of families who have paid the highest price to the conflict. We signed this charter today to inspire young people all over the world. We commit to a life of nonviolence and reconciliation. We promise to listen with empathy and understanding, even if we do not agree. We believe in the power of dialogue with those who are different from us. We seek a universal charter of nonviolence and reconciliation and human rights for all. So how can one stop doing this work even in a situation which is so tense and in my wildest dreams, I never imagined that Israel would be in the situation that we are now. But now more than ever is the time when we have to continue with the work. These kids all went to the summer camp together um, there were 25 Palestinians and 25 Israeli kids. And actually the government tried to prevent uh, us from having the summer camp. Uh, they had a whole session in parliament in which one of the um, members of parliament in his great wisdom said that he would come and blow up the summer camp if we continued to do it. We were very grateful for the help of the Germans and the French and the American embassies who put pressure somewhere, I don't know exactly where, but we were given permission on the very last night to have the summer camp at a place called Ben Shemin. Uh, they, it's a boarding school where the kids were not there, but they were also threatened by the government that they would stop funding if they continued to have the summer camp. And they said that it was dangerous because kids like 14 year old might learn the code to a door and pass on that information. So this is what we are faced with, but I can tell you that I had two grandchildren at the summer camp and um, one is 14 and quite spoiled, I might say. I had taken him to London, shown him Harry Potter and everything that a child would dream of. And so when I met him a week after the summer camp, he said, that was the best time I've ever had in my life. And how extraordinary is that for him to have spent these days with Palestinian kids and for them to share very painful stories but also to have a lot of fun to go to a walk to park, to cook together with chefs and to really be able to express whatever it is they thought about the other. Um, I'm, I'm talking about all of these things first because I think it's terribly important to understand how difficult it is to function when after 20 years of working in schools, um, where a Palestinian and an Israeli would come and tell their stories, sometimes something like Laila and I, um, the only framework within schools where Palestinians and Israelis could come in and teach about reconciliation, the government in its great wisdom and the Ministry of Education saw to it that we are not allowed into the schools anymore. 
what has happened since is many, many of the principals of schools have said that they don't care what the ministry says. They want us to continue to come. We have been doing dialogue meetings all over the country ever since then. And actually, in a way, the fact that the democracy movement recognized that this is a threat, freedom of speech is a basic human right. So what they've done is, you know, they've become much more involved with our work. On a Saturday night before Kaplan, which is where the big demonstrations are in Tel Aviv, we have a dialogue meeting. We had a dialogue meeting outside the house of the Minister of Education. We thought it was important, but he didn't think it was. And of course, he did not attend. So this is just part of what is going on. But also what is wonderful is that the work that we are doing is continuing regardless. So when the army came to tell me that David, my son, had been killed by a Palestinian sniper, one of the first things that I said is, you can't kill anybody in the name of my child. This probably comes, or it was something that I didn't know that I even said, but I think it came from my upbringing in South Africa and the anti-apartheid movement. And it was there somewhere in, in inside of me. And so it wasn't as if um, I became another person. Yes, I had more compassion, but uh, my life changed completely. That's true, because whatever happened, I knew that I wanted them to devote the rest of my life to preventing other families from experiencing this pain. And the framework that I found, or they found me, was the parent circle. And I, um, I remember going to a weekend in East Jerusalem where there were bereaved Palestinian and Israeli families. And I looked into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and I realized that together we were a huge, huge force that could be an example to people around us if we spoke in the same voice. It was life-changing for me that weekend because I knew I'd found the framework. And I started to travel all over the world and I speak English, as you may have noticed. It's my mother tongue. And so, of course, people, uh, it was much easier for me to communicate. And I landed up speaking together with a Palestinian partner in the House of Lords, in, uh, you name it, in the Congress, in Canada, all over the world, in a hip hop concert. And I thought I was terribly important. You know, <laughs> You have this whole vision of yourself, the great peace leader. And one night I was sitting at my computer and there was a knock on the door. I want to say one thing now is that one Palestinian killed my son, not the whole Palestinian nation. There was another knock on the door and I opened the door and there were three soldiers standing there. And when there are three soldiers, it can only mean one thing. So I kept slamming the door in their face. And eventually um, I opened the door and they said, we came to tell you that we caught the man who killed David. That was when everything changed and it became very difficult because that's the same test that Lila went through. Do you mean what you say? It's all very well traveling around the world talking about reconciliation and peace and rainbows and flowers and reading bad poetry, which usually is part of the NGOs I want to do. Um, I didn't know what to do with my life because where was the integrity? You know, it's all very well. How can I do this work if I can't walk the talk? And now there's a face of the man who killed David. What do I do with that? How can I, how can I go around talking about this? talking about reconciliation. So I didn't sleep for many, many months. And after three months, I wrote a letter to the family of the man who killed David. And in the letter, I told them about David. He was a student at Tel Aviv University studying for his master's in the philosophy of education. So education for peace is for me, the best way that I can possibly commemorate this child. And um, he was 
the head of the student uprising, and he was a very charismatic character. Um, I saw, I have pictures of him burning the bill that he got from the university, and he wanted to set his car alight. Fortunately, people stopped him from doing that. But he was a character. He stopped all the traffic from Haifa to Jerusalem in this student uprising. Um, I told them also about the parent circle that we are now actually closer to 700 families um, who have all lost an immediate family member to the conflict. And what we want is to create a framework for a reconciliation process, which needs to be an integral part of any political future agreement. We've signed all kinds of stuff on the White House lawn, haven't we? But we didn't have peace after that. At best, you can have another ceasefire until the next time. Um, I also said that we should meet. We owed that to our children and grandchildren. Two Palestinians from our group delivered that letter to the family. Of course, you can imagine that they were very surprised to have a, a letter from the mother of, somebody, of a boy that their son had killed. Well, so, but they said if everybody would sign on this letter, perhaps there could be peace. So I'm not the most patient character in the Middle East. I imagine that within days I will have a letter from the sniper, his name is Thayer, um, to, I don't know, whatever, you know, that I would hear from him. It took three years and he sent a message over the, the wire, over an internet, uh, to say that I was crazy, which I knew already anyway, and that I should stay away from his family because he killed 10 people to free Palestine. But you see, I knew that when he was a very small child, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army. And he also lost two uncles in the second uprising. I think it was an act of revenge in many ways. He was not aligned to a political party. He went, he chose to go to the Fatah part of jail and not to the Hamas, but he chose to do that. He became a folk hero, as you can imagine. And they made a film about him in a book. So when I got that letter, it was a pivotal part in my life because what happened is I realized that I'm not a victim. You know, my life is no longer contingent on what this man does. And that's an extraordinary sense of freedom. And I gave up, that's when I told you earlier that I'm not a victim, that I'm a victor. It's a big difference. The pain of losing a child is the vile, awful pain that never goes away. It sits next to you for the rest of your life. There's not a morning that I don't wake up and think, maybe I dreamt it. You know, and um, I, we went to South Africa, to where I was born, as you may have noticed from my accent. And, you know, in many lectures that we do, Lila and I, or Basam and I, when traveling around the world, I always ask people, what was your first act of social justice? I mean, can you remember what you did and why you're sitting in this room? Because there's a reason. There's a reason for all of you who are here tonight too. Um, it's There's something that, forced, that pushed you to do that. And I remember that when I was five years old, we lived in Johannesburg and they used to do, the man who delivered the milk in the morning came with a horse and cart and he used to beat the horse. And I'm a big animal lover and I couldn't bear that. So I enlisted my friend Barbara and the two of us went to the dairy with carrots and we stole the horse. And I was five, I mean, and it was a huge cart horse and we brought it home and we put it in our tennis court. And of course my father came home and found the horse in the tennis court. He was not overjoyed. And um, from that I was sent to boarding school. He didn't realize that that was an act of social justice. Nevertheless, we went to South Africa to make a film because we wanted to see if we could learn some lessons from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And if we could 
um, meet with perpetrators and victims and see how that whole um, process worked. And we met the most extraordinary people. And for me, it was a kind of a personal journey of looking to understand what is the meaning, you know, like what is what is the meaning of forgiving? It's another question that I ask many people, and I get various, if we had, if I could see all of your faces, I would ask you, but um, you get different definitions from everybody. And I met this extraordinary woman whose daughter had been killed by the African um, part of the African National Congress. And uh, she had gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and she said to the man, to the three men who killed her daughter, I forgive you. And I wanted to know what that meant. And so I went to meet her and I asked her, what's your definition of forgiving? And she said, for me, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. And then I met the man who actually sent the people who killed her daughter. And he said, by her forgiving me, she has released me from the prison of my inhumanity. And I thought that was the most extraordinary statement. And so I was all set to come back and to try to meet Thaya in jail. I got permission from Tippi Levni, who was then the Minister of Justice. And we were waiting for the police. And then, of course, we have elections. You may have noticed that we have elections quite often in Israel. Hopefully, we will have them very soon again. Um, and uh, we were waiting for the police. And then we got various ministers of justice who were ministers of just us, who had no intention of allowing me to, to go into the jail. But recently, before this government, I got uh, Barlev, who was the head of police, um, got me a woman to write to me from the police, but she said that I can't go into the jail unless he wants to see me. So that's where that stands. <clears throat> Excuse me. But nevertheless, you know, it's not that important anymore. What is important is the work that we're doing. What is important is to know that there is a possibility to create hope. Because if there's no hope, there never will be peace. It's such an important equation in the whole act of peace and looking at young Palestinians who live without a future that they know of. Where is the hope going to come unless we continue to do this work? So I'm going to stop here and you can ask questions. And if they're difficult, ask Lila. Okay? Thank you very much. I met with David the other day uh, here in Sao Paulo. We were in the same city and we got to meet in person. I'm sorry, I we can't were... hear you. You can hear me? Just you? No, or... It was very unclear. Now, now it's clear? That's better. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I was telling that the other day I got to meet David personally here in Sao Paulo. And we were talking about how uh, working with dialogue and nonviolence movements in this context, it, it's really emotional. And I was telling him that uh, during my PhD, I you have the, I'm, I'm not sure how it works abroad, but here in Brazil, you have to approve your first chapter and then you go further to continue the research. And when I, I passed through the, my first chapter test, um, the professors that were in the room, they, they were telling me, okay, this is great, you can do that, you can do that. But then they all said, but you seem very emotionally involved with the subject and this is not good, which I replied to them, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's not other way. It's not uh, some impersonal science here. And I'll yeah, tell you I just... a story about Brazil. I was invited to Rio with 12 journalists of the very top journalists uh, from Israel and Palestine by the UN. So we came to Brazil. We had to sleep in the uh, to we had to sleep in the airport because of there were the gangs in the favela. It was a very bad time, 
And so the next morning we drove into uh, Rio and I looked, you know, it was so um, deja vu of South Africa, driving through this very, very affluent area with beautiful, beautiful houses and then passing through the favela. And of course the journalists were fighting all the time. So I said then, like, why did you actually come all the way to Rio? You can stay in Israel and Palestine and fight there. And then there was an Egyptian woman. And um, every time anybody said anything, she was extremely um, on the side of the Palestinian women, uh, people. So she kept jumping up and she was like ruining the whole conference. Her bad luck, she sat next to me the next morning at breakfast. So I said to her, you know, I'm reading a very interesting book. And she said, well, what is it? I said, it's the man in the white shark skin suit. And she said, well, what is that? And I said, it's all about the Egyptians who threw out the Jews in 1958. Do you see any analogies? And of course it was very, I mean, she was very angry with me, but she came to the talk that I gave and the personal story is what creates the emotional breakthrough. And after that, she came and she hugged me. And so that is the work of the parent circle, is this emotional breakthrough that gets created by you listening. How could anybody, the hardest of hearts, not be moved by what Lila said tonight? I don't think that's possible. So it's not that they will become Martin Luther King, but there is that effect that comes out of, out of the sharing of pain and what, what is the difference in pain between me and Lila? It's the same. When I cry, it's the same color. So you can use those stories as an example for people who are very cynical. You know? That's why I told you. So I'm going to open now the floor to the public if anyone has questions. Sim, eu queria fazer duas perguntas, uma para a Rob, e vocês estão, estão escutando a tradução em inglês? Rob, Laila, Shuri... I'm on the English channel, yes, I understand you. Ok, é, eu queria perguntar para a Rob e para a Laila a yeah. situação seguinte, eu estou no momento em Salvador, o Brasil tem 40 mil assassinatos por ano. E em Salvador, a maior parte da população é uma população negra. Como você disse, Rob, lembra muito a África do Sul, pelo visto. A minha pergunta a vocês é, da experiência de vocês, da vivência de vocês, o que vocês poderiam dizer às mulheres brasileiras, às famílias que sofreram perdas, o que vocês poderiam dizer a elas como fazer o processo do perdão e da aproximação é, é, e criar um movimento, talvez, é, aprendendo de vocês, ok? É muito bom escutar vocês, mas, por outro lado, a minha visão é como nós podemos assumir essa experiência e aplicar ela, talvez, aqui, para diminuir a violência eh, no Brasil. Essa é a minha pergunta a vocês. E ao Chuli, eu Oi. queria perguntar sobre eh, o processo educativo. Desculpa que eu volto, Chuli, ao Yad Beyad, mas eh, eh, você sempre fala em sociedade mista, em reconciliação, em igualdade. Como você fez isso desde zero anos no sistema é, educacional. Então, primeiro Rob e Laila, e depois Chuli, se podem me responder. Obrigado. So, you want me to answer what I think? I'm not quite sure what's going on. But, okay. Lógico. For me, I think that one of the most important things that you could take from us is the Parallel Narr Narrative Project because that's what Lila started to talk about. And this is a, a, a program 
that is generally we try to find the same um, the same profession, but not always. Sometimes it's just for mothers or it can be, it's not only for bereaved people. We have nearly 2000 alumni who are not at all bereaved, but they could be doctors or lawyers or educators or mothers, any those kind of, we try to find the same um, from both sides. They would come for a three months um, project which is filled with unilateral uh, meetings and then meeting together. They would go to Yad Vashem, which Lila started to tell you, the Holocaust Museum. They would go then to a village, a Palestinian village. The idea is not about comparison of suffering, but the idea is history through the human eye. How do you see your history? Then you would have a professor, a Palestinian and an Israeli and you would take the milestones of the history. So for Israel, 1948 is the creation of the State of Israel, but for the Palestinians, that's the Nakba. And then you would take the 67, 73, the two Intifada, any important milestone in the history of both sides with a Palestinian and an Israeli historian, you live in a parallel universe after that because there's nothing that would be seen as the same in, in the history through their eyes. But what happens with that is there's this creation of empathy. Empathy, even if you don't agree. And that's the most important part because that's a kind of a beginning of talking. You know, you can experience it in a classroom. When you go into an average Israeli classroom of kids age 17, which is the age that we choose. I'm sorry, I just have to cough. Okay, if you go into an average, a classroom of, of 17 year olds and the first thing I would ask them, who of you uh, have ever met a Palestinian before? Probably nobody in the class, right? Who's been overseas, who speaks Arabic? Maybe one. Who's been overseas? Probably the whole class. And so there's no contact between the Palestinian and the Israelis the first time in their lives that they experience the humanity of the other. And that comes out of the stories. And that's what I'm telling you is to, what do I know about Brazil and, and the problems that you have? But I do know that storytelling is a part of, of healing. And maybe that's how you can create a storytelling. I wish I knew more about what's really going on there. But I know that this works. When I was in Sri Lanka, they asked for that program as well. Wherever I've been, you can do it in America with the crazy white uh, uh, extremist groups and, and ordinary, you know, it's just a, a, a process that works. So you, it's a history process. How do you see it? But it's a lot of storytelling. How many black people really get the opportunity to say who they are. We are working on a series now, which hopefully is gonna land up in Netflix. I hope so. I hope it won't be in memory of Robbie Damon because it's taking a hell of a long time. But um, it's an opportunity, for instance, to tell the story of a Palestinian prisoner because, you know, who's done something. How do people only can call them a terrorist? They don't know the human story behind them. How did the person get to this point where they could do this terrible, you know, acts of crime, crime acts? And in my opinion, there's an organization called um, Breaking the Silence. Now, actually, these kids are soldiers who come and give evidence of what they did in the army. For me, they are the future for a reconciliation process. They have to give the Israeli evidence and the Palestinians will have to find the equivalent, and that might be those prisoners. So I don't know, um, I'm not here to give solutions to anybody else. I hardly know what I'm doing myself. So that's all I have to say for that. Lila, sorry, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I agree with Robbie. And at the same time, I think if, in any kind of conflict, we start to work with women 
this will be much more important because there are the the one who are responsible and raise the children. And if she starts like to, to treat her children in a good way and teach them how to understand the others, how to respect the others uh, one by one, I think this situation will be changed. And if she maybe convince her husband, her brother or her family. So because of that, I believe of the power of the woman, they they have a power to change and they have a power to do uh, new things and a new idea. So this is what I believe. Lana, tell them about the project that we're doing. Maybe the, the Palestinian project. I'm sorry, maybe Shuli should also say something. <laughs> I told you. We could give afternoon. him a chance to answer and then we will talk about the project. After uh, uh, I, I spoke to Shuli this afternoon. And I told him that the Palestinians reckon that if the Hamas will kidnap me, they'll give me back in half an hour because I talk so much. So please, you can stop. I'm waiting for the moderator's uh, order. <laughs> it's the... Uh, um... Yes, I'm just like listening to you because it's super interesting. So for me, you're not talking a lot. <laughs> but yeah, surely, please. Okay, um, uh, many years ago, I, I, I always brought my students uh, in school. And, uh, I was a teacher in elementary school that year. Uh, I, I was teaching Arabic and I brought them together uh, for um, um, encounter with the uh, Palestinian kids on the, on the neighboring village of the kibbutz. And one of the children didn't really want to go. He, he was afraid. And he came up to me and said, why we the children must do what the, you adults do not do? Because a few days before that, there was a fight between the shepherds of the kibbutz and the shepherds of the uh, Arab village. And then... I didn't really understand him. Only a decade later, uh, I went on a trip with a group of uh, peace activists to Northern Ireland in 1995. It was before the agreement there, three years before the agreement. And the Cold World Trust uh, took us to see um, uh, uh, tens of projects who are, which were which brought Protestants and Catholics together, agricultural um, farmers, uh, shopping center, uh, even a history museum, shared history museum of uh, Northern Ireland, and everywhere I asked them, but what about the children? I mean, we didn't see even one educational project for the for the Protestant and, and Catholic children. Everywhere they said, well, the, the kids will follow. And this brought me back to that student in grade five, 10 years earlier, uh, that asked me that hard question. Over the time, I and, and I was uh, an educator and, and I... Uh, brought together thousands, tens of thousands of children uh, in, in, in Israel and Palestine. And we always said, the children are the future. The children are not rotten like we are. They will bring the peace. And it was then when I understood, when I learned from the uh, Irish, Northern Irish activists that this is not right. That First and foremost, we need to bring the adults into this activity. And only the adults, as Lila said, only the mothers can educate the children. 
not in school. Um, this is so hard learning for me. For me, it was, uh, and the question, the initial question was, what changed your ideology? <laughs> this is one of the things that changed my uh, approach to, to peace building. Um, this is, uh, and today I can say I'm, I have 10 grandchildren and all of them are on the kibbutz. And I can say now that also the grandparents have a big role uh, to, uh, to, to educate the children. This is not only practically more right, it is also ethically more right. This is, un this is totally unfair, even, even a chutzpah, I don't know how you will you translate this to, to Portuguese, to, to ask the children, to expect the children to bring the peace, whatever we are failing to do. This is unfair to expect the children to do this. Every, in all the curriculum of the children, of the schools is filled with the achievements of humanity. Every, um, every, every mathematical solution is brought to them after, after the Greek, the Greeks even uh, um, uh, solved it. Every, um, every poem that we bring to the curriculum in, in the schools was, was discussed thoroughly by us um, adults. Why of all the issues, the unsolved issue, the bleeding and bleedingly unsolved issue must be brought to the children's desk to solve. This is unfair. In this issue also, the same as in other issues, we have to share our achievements with the children. And if not achievements, at least we have to share our deeds with the children. Therefore, in hand in hand, where the children are coming to study together, uh, we created um, uh, communities of adults around the schools. The children are not only going to the schools and coming back home to a totally segregated environment. They are coming home to an environment where they know that in the evening, our parents are going to a meeting. Or together, the entire community is celebrating all the, um, all the, the, the uh, uh, holidays of both uh, the Arabs and the Jews in Israel, Muslims, Christians, Jewish, whatever. It is creating the environment for the, for the school education that makes the change, not just the children. Davi, did I address your question? At least if not answered. I'm not sure if you want to say something, Davi. Julie, you are the first person that I've met that actually, because I've been saying this from the Irish, you know, they did all the research about the parents for years and everybody gets very angry with me. Thank you, because it's absolutely right. But there's no peace in Ireland. There's a very good ceasefire. There's a very good one and only, only then a very they started good to bring the kids. Yes. But uh, that's true, but only it was only then, since 1998, that they started to build, bring the children together. But the children aren't really together in Ireland, certainly not in Northern Ireland. And they have a long way to go because they've never done any kind of truth telling. And the British are a lot to blame for that. Well, but let's not go into the Irish. I'd rather just swap for their... I'd rather have their situation. Better. Much easier. Uh, in Hebrew, we say, Asolot rechokim ze anachnu. Like... No, if I'm tea. Asolot rechokim ze anachnu. We love to talk about others. Well, actually, most Israelis think that ours is the most impossible situation to solve. Everybody thinks their conflict is. Of course. Of course. It's a good way out of it. So we're just having a conversation now. 
I I have a question, but I wanted to ask if anyone from the audience has, because I think it's more fair. We seem to have lost Lana. Yeah, Zef, do you want to talk? I don't know. I think that uh, uh, I don't know how many people are there uh, that participated in the session of the morning, uh, but I think that your question, Davi, was very, very important related to what uh, we talked in the morning, in this morning session, when we start thinking about what can be transferred from one uh, uh, community to another, from one culture to another, uh, for in one hand, you cannot compare because uh, in Israel, the conflict between the two communities is not the same as the violence in the streets of Brazil. It's not because there are two communities. Yes, you can compare for, with one thing, the idea of oppressed and uh, oppressor. And that's one thing that is very much uh, similar. In Israel and in uh, Brazil, there is a situation of classes, of power, of uh, uh, feeling of superiority of one community against the other. And that can be transferred, but not the idea of the bereaved uh, uh, mothers or whatever, you can talk about the power, how you can give power, how you can empower the mothers. And in this, I do believe what uh, Lila said, that mothers are the uh, key to the solution, not to the problem. They can make the change. They are the strongest one. And like uh, uh, Shuli said, you cannot ask the children to change. You have to go to the parents because these children <laughs> are coming home at, in the evening and they will believe what they see and not what they heard in school or whatever. They will see, they will believe what their parents do. Even if they speak very nicely, it's not enough. What Shuli said in his uh, uh, speech about uh, the uh, not only participate together, not only cooperation, but really being uh, together as um, an equal. equal. And that's the big difference that I think uh, should be accepted and done. So thank you. It was really nice to listen to all of you. Just by the way, I think one of the so, so things that the parent circle uh, time... So, 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 desculpa, só para dar continuidade ao, ao Zé. Pode chamar Lobão. Ao Lobão, Sorry? é o caso ele chama o Lobão. É, é, Zeev em português a tradução é Lobão que era o nome do era o apelido do, do Lobão desse senhor que está aí sentado. É, eu concordo plenamente. É, inclusive em Israel o Woman é, o HP quando fez sua primeira cam caminhada a Vangali Matai a Prêmio Nobel da Paz da Quênia esteve presente. E uma das conclusões que eu sempre dou nas minhas palestras é que o século 21 é o século da mulher, é o século das emoções, é o século da, 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 de se reencontrar com a mãe natureza, com a mãe terra. E essa é a força. Quer dizer, quando a Rob comentou e a, e, a, e a Laila comentaram que através da mulher, realmente eu acredito, nós estamos aqui em Salvador agora, já em contato com a Uni Jorge para tentar fazer o primeiro projeto e o objetivo é reunir mulheres que sofreram de violência e mulher que sofre de violência na família, ela pode ser preta ou ela pode ser branca. e Então, aí vem o encontro 
dessas comunidades conflituantes numa temática da violência, não de uma comunidade com a outra, mas do, do centro da vida delas. E, da, a partir daí, realmente desenvolver um projeto. Então, realmente, eu acredito que a mulher é aí a, 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 a empowerment da mulher. A, eu já nem sei como se diz empowerment em português. É, o, é, é daí que tem que partir a, 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 o projeto that people use so easily, and I don't think I have the right to empower anybody, but I could maybe do something for them to support their self-esteem. That empower word is a dangerous word. It's like tolerance. It's the same problem. So sorry I said that, but I did want to tell you something, Zev, that we have um, in the parent circle, firstly, the first woman co-director, Palestinian. You know, we have two offices. We have two of everything. It's like Noah's Ark. So there's like two um, co-directors, one Palestinian, one Israeli. And the Palestinian, for the first time, is a woman, which is really great. We have two educators, two people in charge of every, every subject of education, of everything. And that, I mean, it's not an equal situation. Whatever we do, we are still not an equal situation. But what we can do is to do anything that we possibly can to create dignity. And by doing that, nobody can sign a check without the other, nobody can make a project without the other, nobody can take any basic big decision without both sides agreeing. It can make life very difficult, but I think it's the best thing that we could possibly do to create some dignity. Yeah, I, I want, want to, to add. Can, can I just uh, no, go ahead? I want to add something. Uh, what, in the bereaved family circle, I, I, I believe that they're creating an internal reality of, of, of equality, which is extremely important to protect those who are wishing to live in equality. But I wanted to mention to Zev that I'm seeing this from as a friend of the bereaved families circle in Israel, uh, that um, I'm, I'm saying this not from the inside, although uh, uh, my aunt, my, my mother's uh, sister uh, did uh, lose her son. And I do remember this from her years ago, that this, they, I, be, I believe that all over the world in a, um, in a way, there are people who bereave their uh, beloved ones. And what the bereaved family circle is doing here is leveraging the power, the huge power of sorrow, unfortunately, to get into the hearts of the people. I'm not sure, I'm, I, 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 I have no knowledge on what's going on in Brazil. But I believe that everywhere in the world, there is sorrow and bereavement. And maybe even in the, in, or, or I would put it this way, in everywhere that there is uneven power, um, power relations, there is also sorrow and pain that caused by losing loved ones. Therefore, Shuri. Shuri. maybe, I think that both uh, uh, Robbie and Lila said one thing that is very important. The bereavement is not only there, but the idea of not being a victim and start acting. And that's the big difference. And I think that this is the lesson that can be transmitted all over the world. Because yeah, the can most I add something? easily way is to be a victim. I wanted to add something since uh, this book, because of course they are like very, very different situations. I, my master's is in compared history, which is like a, a methodology. And we say that nothing is comparative, but everything is comparative. This is because we can only understand the world through comparison. For example, 
Um, I know which food I like because I know what I don't like. I know which painting I think it's beautiful because I, there are paintings that I think they are not beautiful. So like we, our brain compares a lot. Um, so there are totally different situations, but I believe that uh, Robbie said something and she said, when a Palestinian and Israeli meet for the first time, it's the first time they can experience the humanity in the other one. And I believe this is very present in Brazil and in many societies. It's truly segregated. Like uh, here, uh, kids in favelas die every day. And it's it's like they're lost. It's not a, the same loss of a white child, you know, like, because because we don't experience life with them, we don't. I do social work. I work in an NGO. I I don't. I I, I have like black and friends from the favelas because I, I I go after it. But even so, it's not the same as they just said now. As as Rob just said now, it, it's not the same. Like so, we we don't have the opportunity to experience the humanity in the other, and this generates and, and replicates a lot of prejudice. So I believe none of those um, solutions in different contexts, they're gonna come without a, 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 a in Portuguese, we would say de deconstruction of this prejudice that it's very well built in our brains. So I, I believe this is the same, you know, like the, the, the vision of the other, the lack of humanity and all of these atrocities we believe to be true about the other. This is something that needs to be deconstructed in order to build something equal and, and together. I, I wanted to ask you, I'm not sure we have time. We only have five, ten, nine minutes. I, I wanted to ask you, all the three of you, we lost Lila, right? So to Robbie and Shirley, um, I know it's a broad question, um, but if you can sum up. Do, do you see, uh, in my research, I've been noticing that during the past years, the dialogue and nonviolent movements, they have been increasing in number of movements. There are more movements and a number of people as well in this context of increased violence and everything that has been happening in the Israeli government, unfortunately. Do, do you see like um, impact? What, what, what kind of impact do you see in, in like real life I wanted to ask about it, like change or, or no, not even change, but like impact. What 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 is this generating? Because like the political wave, it's in this way, but it seems that there are a lot of people in the society that want something else. Who are you asking that? Who do you? Ask? You, Rob. Ah, you. you both. You both. Então, só, só um minutinho, Bob, Bob, só um minuto antes de você responder. Nós temos até as três horas, porque às três e quinze nós começamos a próxima sessão. É, tá? Eu preciso cinco minutos sair, então eu quero, antes de mais nada, agradecer muito, mas muito, é, a Rob, a Laila, a Shuli. É, infelizmente, nós não tivemos o Ali Abuad aqui conosco, mas... É, escutar vocês três é realmente é, uma esperança de que é, não só em Israel e na Palestina nós possamos fazer algo, mas também em outras partes do mundo com o exemplo de vocês. Muito, muito, muito obrigado. E é desculpa que eu tenho que sair por cinco é minutos para organizar a próxima sessão. É I think we've, we've heard enough from us and we can say thank you and leave. Yes? Thank you. Thank you. Is it time to leave or to ask, uh, to answer Carla's question? In if a... you wish to answer. answer. Uh, I wish to yes. answer it in 30, 30 seconds. I have created a, uh, a spreadsheet of Excel uh, counting the number of people only in Israel who are um, actually living in partnerships. <clears throat> and I counted very, um, very, um, uh, very uh, low esti estimate of the people who are there connected with in um, immediately every day. Uh, I reached uh, 70,000 people in Israel who are directly impacted 
by partnership with the other side. I, when I mean de deeply impacted, I mean uh, that they are living, they know always when there is a, um, um, a holiday or special day of the other side, they are, they are living the life of both. This is a huge number in our terms, in Israel terms. Um, actually, two members of Knesset, you can uh, get with this. <laughs> But uh, it's um, only, and this is only the with the organ the civil society organizations who are um, who are shared, truly shared, and uh, co-owned, owned together by Jews and Palestinians. This is very conservative count. We have more. In other words, the last twenty years after October two thousand a new era we moved from coexistence of nice cities, of nice people to people, to partnerships, which is very hard, but much more fruitful. Thank you so much. I'm gonna be getting in touch with you after this. <laughs> I want to thank all of the speakers and the V and all of the staff and everyone who showed up was amazing to be a part of this discussion, this dialogue. Yeah, I hope you have a great weekend ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Laila Tov. Thank you very much. Good night. Laila Tov. Good night, Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.